Well, good morning and welcome once again to Cedardale. We're so pleased you've taken the time to join us today. And uh, I know Pastor Grant's been preaching on a series called The Missions of Christ. But he's going to take a break today because today's a special day. This is Father's Day and we want to extend our greetings and our blessings to all the fathers, uncles, grandfathers, and other men of influence in a family. And we thank you for your leadership in the family. So I just can't wait to hear Pastor's message, but let's read some scripture first. He's asked me to read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 7. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For it is by the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, Though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became the heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And that's our blessed scripture for today. May it bless your hearts. And now here is Pastor Grant to bring us today's wonderful message. Well, the Lord bless you, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. What a marvelous day it is to celebrate uh, the gift of a father or a uncle or a grandfather in a life because they're so important today. Uh, I believe it's a ministry and that's the title of my message, the ministry of fatherhood. It is a vital ministry, much like at Mother's Day when I talked about the joy of motherhood or the ministry of motherhood. It is a very important ministry like none other. Well, let's open in prayer and then I have some wonderful scriptures to share with you and then we'll dive right into this wonderful message this morning. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift and the opportunity to uh, raise a little life, uh, raise teenagers and even young adults as we see them getting prepared uh, to move and uh, get jobs and do all these things in this world. We just thank you that uh, we can have an influence and an impact on them. We thank you for the life of the church and we thank you for the wonderful examples that they have in so many churches across Canada and United States and the world, we do thank you for this wonderful opportunity of fatherhood. We thank you, Father. And we thank you for your fatherhood because without it, we would where would we be? We thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your kindness toward us. And we give you praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 6, 9 is very important. Uh, to our understanding of what's going on today, we uh, are going to be looking at uh, Genesis 7, verse 1. That's our core text. But there's a lot in Genesis 6, especially verse 9, that uh, ties into this and is very important. Uh, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Now, this verse is coming from the New Living Translation, and I really like the way they put that. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 7, very important. Kay just read it, but here it is in the New King James Version. By faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, 
prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. But Psalm 103 verse 3 is a worthy text to consider as well. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. What a marvelous bunch of scripture this is. And of course, Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, I just relish that chapter. But Genesis 7, 1 is our text. Let me read it again for you. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. You know, fatherhood is under attack today like no other. Uh, the same as the Ministry of Motherhood is under attack. It seems like this world is going more wobbly as we move along. I've often used the terms topsy-turvy, but today I'm using the word wobbly. <laughs> but regardless, uh, I want to encourage the fathers, the grandfathers, and the wonderful uncles that are spending time with their families and those that they love to keep on keeping on with this vital ministry. This is an important ministry. God looks at it with favor, and it's a very important to note that Noah spared or saw his whole family spared. It is possible, it is doable, and it is always available when we look to God and his leading that we can have that influence on in our families as well and see wonderful things that only God could bring about because of maybe even one person's faith, which we're going to see in a minute. I want to bless you fathers for the wonderful impact that you're making. I want to take the time to thank you uh, because I was the recipient as well of a wonderful father who helped me and guided me throughout my life. But I was always, all, all again, I was the recipient of wonderful uncles, whether it was on my mom's side or my dad's side, who spent time with me when they had the time and uh, I learned valuable lessons from their lives and they shared with me and uh, I enjoy those wonderful jaunts to Niagara Falls I had with my uncles even back then and different things that we were able to do and uh, it's marvelous they're wonderful memories and the influence of a father the influence of a grandfather or an uncle on the life or any life is so important 1 Corinthians 13, I do not want to leave this text out. It says, love is patient, love is kind, and it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. The love of a father is so important, and actually, we're going to hear about that next week in my message on the third installment of the mission of Christ. As we begin, let me go back to this wonderful message. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen. I want you to think about that. The Lord says, I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. In Genesis, we see the glimpse of a man and his wonderful confidence in incredible faith in a barbaric, cruel world. So, so many times throughout Genesis 6, the word violent and the inclinations of his heart uh, wickedness, the evil that is spreading like wildfire in this time. Uh, I mentioned this in the Zoom study on Wednesday that we see the first homicide coming out of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 4. Uh, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, two chapters away, we're seeing the whole world engulfed in violence and hatred, brutal, brutal cruelty. Uh, and that's the Hebrew nature of those words. It was, wasn't just cruel, it was brutally cruel, horrible beyond any explanation. Uh, but we see a cruel world when Noah is going about doing his stuff back then. Cruel, the entire world. It wasn't just one country or anything like that. The entire world was cruel. It's, a mar it's an amazing thing to think about. So I pondered this thought, that of all the tragedies that can happen to men, None is greater than when they lose their spiritual or moral compass and it becomes broken. This moral compass can become broken and everyone does what is right in their own eyes. This was happening in Noah's day, even before we find that out later in the Old Testament. But this is not the case with Noah, as we will soon learn. Noah's eminence is amazing when one considers these amazing facts. 
and here they are. And if you have some paper and pen, I encourage you to write them down. Noah had no Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. He did not have that. He had no Psalms to guide him in his way or light his path, as Psalm 119 talks about. He had no Gospels. Well, we have four Gospels of the life of Christ. He had none. He had no Gospels on the life of Christ to guide him. He had no epistles. He had no church epistles like we have. We have them all. And we have a complete Bible. He had nothing. Uh, he had no epistles to help him understand providence and the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, we do. Uh, he had no books, no commentaries. He had no Bible college to attend. He, he, yet Noah, despite it all, of everything he doesn't have, but continues to believe God mightily. This is an amazing thing. Uh, it says in Hebrews 11, verse 7, that he was moved, uh, almost compelled forward with a holy fear or a holy awe or reverence of God. Uh, he had no books. Noah didn't even have a technical manual on building an ark. Uh, he had no search engine like we've got with Google or he didn't have no chat at or whatever they call it now for AI. He didn't have nothing like that. He had no iPad, no ThinkPad. He had no iPhone. Can you imagine? He had no iPhone. <laughs> he had no consultants to help him in this building of an ark. Someone has had, while well, observing this glimpse into Noah's life, these things, uh, Noah planned ahead. Well, everyone didn't. Noah didn't wait for a ship to come in. He went out and built one. <laughs> I find that amusing. But uh, Noah stayed fit because when you're 500 years old, uh, God might ask you to do something really big. <laughs> um, Noah didn't heed the critics either, friends. That's another important thing. He did what had to be done for the glory of God. And that we can find out in Isaiah 61, 1, verse 3. Noah, didn't have, Noah had a great life philosophy, you know. He wasn't in a hurry, and he did what had to be done, and it took him at least, what we understand through other scholars, is that it took him at least 100 years. Uh, Noah was 500 years old uh, at this juncture in his life when he's told by the Lord to build this ark, and uh, we know that he was around 600 or so when he finished the building of the ark, or when the floodwaters began to come on the earth in Genesis 7, verse 6. Noah listened to God intently, uh, who is the giver of gifts and talent. And uh, we have to remember that Noah was an amateur in this building of this great, great colossus of a ship. Uh, but those that built the Titanic, actually, I did research on this, they saw it sink in two hours and 40 minutes. Noah's ark didn't sink. Um, Noah was wise because he didn't miss the boat while the entire world of mankind did. I want you to think about that, how Solomon thought that is. We certainly learned this gigantic lesson from Noah's life, which is Noah's faith is far better than unbelief. And maybe the greatest thing that we can learn from Noah's life, and I really want all the fathers here to hear this, if God is with you and his face is shining upon you, nothing is greater or impossible for after the flood waters were gone, God made this great covenant with Noah personally. Isn't that marvelous? The favor of God was upon Noah's life. What we know of Noah actually comes from the biblical record. And I encourage you to stay with the biblical record. Don't go to the movies. The movies always have some stupid part that goes off the tracks. And uh, it's always better to go to the biblical record to understand the true story. The Bible in Genesis chapters 5 to 9 gives us the bulk of what we know about Noah and his times. Uh, Noah was married and had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Each of Noah's sons had a wife. While Noah spent many years building the ark, uh, his grandfather Methuselah and father Lamech were alive. That's important to know. Uh, it's even conceivable that they too may have assisted Noah in this grand project for God which God had given Noah. The Bible makes clear that Noah walked with God and found grace or favor in his sight. And it's marvelous. It's almost something like Micah 6, 8, that, that Noah walked humbly with God. Noah was actually in the 10th generation 
of the human race at this very time, uh, roughly 1,650 years after creation. And that's all it took for mankind to descend into horrible wickedness. And his name actually means, the name Noah means comfort or rest in Genesis 5.29. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, mentioned mentions Noah as a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2.5, who was moved by faith again and got godly, godly fear. Jesus mentions Noah's time as well when he says, in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, and marrying, and giving in marriage up to the very day that Noah entered the ark. The Bible, or the biblical summary of the rest of mankind at this time is this, and this is a horrible summary but it's given by God. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now you have to remember there was no police station. There was no EMS. There was no fire departments. There was nothing, nothing to keep this bulk of mankind in check at all. Uh, what we certainly gather from this biblical record is this. Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences, terrible worldwide consequences. And there was only one door to the ark, as Jesus himself said, that he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. There's only one entrance to God's redemption and salvation, and that is through his son, as there was only one way into the ark through one door. Very important. First point today is Noah's marvelous faith. Well, Noah's culture bashed him and pounded him relentlessly, he wavered not. He stood as a champion amongst the undercurrent of bitter and cold-blooded opinion. Our scripture today states that this immovable fact, by faith, Noah, that's all we need really, by faith, Noah, and then the ark was built. His faith was first, friends. That's, a, that's an amazing thought I want to give you today, and faith should always be first. The foundation and bedrock on which he built everything was his pure and holy faith. It's, this pri it's the primary thing. It's a holy thing and it's a vital thing that God actually looks for. For he himself says in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 22, I searched or I looked for a man but found none. His faith dovetailed in his reverence or awe of the almighty God. And it's important to note that his faith and fear or his awe of the living God was an incubator for a holy and robust obedience that actually saved him, his wife, and his entire family from the peril that was going to pounce on the earth at this time. Nothing in the life of Noah is held up as mightily as the fact of his hearty faith and a holy example that sprung and blossomed out of a mighty conviction and fearless living coupled with a holy piety that got God's attention. So today, we all must begin where Noah began, and that is to begin with faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. For faith is having complete trust in God despite what the world thinks or what the world does. The scripture says, whoever believes on him will never be put to shame in Romans 10 verse 11. And how shall they preach except they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace while bringing glad tidings of good things. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we must take care of our faith and tend to it as a well-watered garden, as the prophet Isaiah says. The single most important question today for all of us is this question. How is your faith? To believe in the Lord is the greatest and grandest thing any father, uncle, or anyone can do right now on this planet. For only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that is from an author who is unknown, unfortunately. Faith is the acorn from which the mighty oak of homes will grow and flourish in this world. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We also see this as well. Noah believed in the Lord in his day-to-day -day life. 
before the seismic waves rolled on the earth, before the deluge and the torrents of rain that swept the earth asunder, before the cascade of floods in a sudden outbreak, puddles becoming rivulets and then gushing into turbulent floodwaters engulfing the entire earth. And yes, I believe the flood was worldwide, completely worldwide. Against the backdrop of the floodwaters was Noah's steadfast, immovable, and mighty faith. Before the words which came to his heart that such a time was coming in the secret place, Noah was still and knew that he was God. He knew that the Lord, he is God, Psalm 100, verse 3. The Most High over all the earth, Psalm 83, verse 16. Whispered into his heart was God's great counsel, as the psalmist would say in Psalm 32, verse 8. Noah believed in God, and he became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Yes, he did. And we know that with certainty that he did. For the Holy Scriptures teach us that he walked faithfully with God and was a just man in all his ways, as Genesis 6-9 would say, and perfect or blameless in his many generations. Let me remind us all of this biblical fact, which is this, to be just in the sight of the living God is never possible apart from faith. That's an important thought. Because God's word guides us here when it declares that the just shall walk by faith, not by sight. That two must be in agreement, walking humbly with him, as Micah would say. It's a wonderful thing to have faith in God when the trials and fiascos and abominable things happen that are beyond us. To have a vigorous faith that God will truly provide and that all our hairs are actually numbered and God knows that. To know that his steadfast love never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And they are new every morning because great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. That God is there and will never leave us nor forsake us. A, faith, a firm faith like this in and out of the marketplace and conventions in life is a sweet balm of Gilead to the soul. To trust God in the mysterious ways of providence. To trust him as the one who answers our prayers and to trust him as the Lord of our life. What I have learned along the way so far in my walk of faith is this resounding truth. Faith, true biblical faith, must be the constant dweller in the house of my heart, not an occasional guest that pops in once in a while for a quick chat. Faith must be with me wherever I go. Faith must be my trusty shield, as St. Paul would say in Ephesians 6, a piece of holy equipment that I never forget, never lose, and never, never, ever ignore. I've also learned that ease in Zion is a dangerous thing, for with ease and solitude, I must be aware and ready to guard my heart, for out of it flow all the issues of life, as Solomon would say in Proverbs 4. By faith, Noah did everything he was asked of him before he strolled into the ark. He committed his work to the Lord, and his plans were established, as Proverbs 16, 3 would say. Also, another thing we learn here is that Noah believed God and didn't doubt. He believed what God said, even when it seemed incredible and way beyond human comprehension or understanding. Imagine, imagine, friends, there was no local marina like we have here in Pefala, no lake like Lake Simcoe to put the anchor, no place to secure the keel of this massive ark. He was to build an ark and manufacture it like this, a sea-going ship, 450 feet times 75 times 45. Approximately, this ark would be 510 feet long. It would take one and a half football fields to equal the, ark, the ark's length. It was more than 50 feet tall and had the same storage capacity as 450 semi-trucks, it's estimated by some scholars that 3.1 million board feet of lumber was used in the construction of this ark. And up to the 20th century, it was in the same category as the Royal Caribbean's boat, The Wonder of the Seas, for it truly was the wonder of the seas in its day. Noah was guided by the Lord to build this massive ark. 
A faith that believes in the probable or most likely, brethren, wasn't Noah's faith. The faith which believes in the impossible is the faith that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. There were no could be, should be's, or might be's with Noah's faith. He rested and resided in the word of the Lord. His noble faith is the faith the book of Hebrews heralds and publishes with much delight. The book of Hebrews describes this holy faith this way, a faith that received the promises, a faith that saw the walls of Jericho come down and crumble, the faith that saw the Red Sea split apart and the Israelites walk on dry ground, a faith that shut the mouth of lions and conquered kingdoms and even set mobilized armies to flight. For with God, all things are possible, Jesus said. Friend, it's not probability, but a steeled certainty, which is the infrastructure which faith is built on when the Lord himself has spoken. It should be dad and mom. Yes, it should be our grand ambition to be, not be great reasoners or great philosophers, but to be great believers. That is really our calling as mom and dad and really live it in front of our children and their friends daily, weekly, in season and out of season. None, absolutely none of God's words fall to the ground as we learn in 1 Samuel 3. And so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Isaiah 55. The Lord always accomplishes what he says or what he talks about. We are not to stagger at the world, but live in awe of it, my friends. Bless the Lord for such holy examples that, that we have been given in the scripture, that we can follow their wonderful example and live a life of faith. Secondly, I would like to speak on today, Noah's holy fear or awe or reverence, so to speak. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of God, of things not yet seen, moved with holy fear, the Bible says. Now note that term moved with fear. We must note that it was faith that molded him, but it was the awe of God that moved him into action. Noah was not living in, in the terror of God like a shackled prisoner standing in front of a judge or magistrate. Paul said, for this reason, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep which I've committed unto him against that day. Noah had a loyal reverence for God. He feared him as El Shaddai, which means my supplier. He feared him as Elohim, as my creator, and ultimately as Adonai, my master. Well, in our day today, we would probably say that the same thing, only a little different. We would reverence God as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the true Alpha and Omega of everything. It was this reverence, friends, or awe, which pulsed within him. This holy awe he truly had amidst the insanity and gross pleasures and sin and horrendous immorality, the profane world of his day, reveling and glorying and shaking its fist at God every day. It's interesting to note that his holy reverence kept him loyal and true to what God had said. He didn't choose or select a better wood or come up with a better ingredient for the tar or the pitch. He didn't alter the vessel in any way to his specifications. He didn't add to the levels in the ark. He didn't put in more windows or doors. He didn't take the sliding door and put it in instead of the door he was supposed to. He didn't cut smaller beams. What we learn is this. He didn't lean on his own understanding at all. He did exactly what he was told to do and left the consequences and results with the Lord Almighty. In all his ways, he acknowledged him and the Lord certainly directed every step and every blow of his hammer. Noah moved with a holy fear, wasn't moved by his own ego or moved by his self-wisdom. He didn't deceive himself, for he knew that this could lead to vanity and a chasing after the wind, as it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. This reverence or holy fear inspired Noah to chop the trees, plane the massive timbers, and wield the axe and hammer with force. 
It even made him ignore and forgo those nasty onlookers who came to tease and taunt him, saying, Noah, where's your God? The reverence and holy awe gave him a diligence and durableness that he relied on the Lord Almighty. This holy reverence was like the breath of the Almighty that strengthened him with a brave defiance and a holy resolve in the zeitgeist of his age. This holy awe or reverence kept him, and that's another sub-point of this. Yes, it kept him, for Noah believed on and believed on with a courageous optimism, so much so that even his whole family joined him in it. And all of them found shalom and found safety and the comfort within the ark. Fathers, it is here that I must mention how important your faith is to your family right now in this day, because we're living in a day and age where it's just horrible what's going on. We can't expect our families to be excited about God and his word while we sleep in Sunday morning and expect them to go to church. Yes, we, Fathers, uncles, grandfathers, we are the imperial example that they desperately need in this world of woe at this time. In this precarious time, it's very precarious. With its gross immorality, despite his faith being ridiculed, Noah pressed on and onward with a glowing enthusiasm and a love for God. Despite being pulled and shredded by the throngs, who upheld meanness and hostility, Noah walked with God as his great shepherd, like Psalm 23 suggests. Walking through this valley of scorn, with God preparing a banquet of grace before him, before his brutal, brutal enemies. And all the while, goodness and mercy were his constant companions, skipping behind him all the way into the ark. This will stun you as it did me. Noah was a solitary witness against the entire world at the time. For one with God is always a majority, brethren. I hope you understand that. And that's a powerful truth that the Bible does teach all the way from Genesis to Revelation. He trudged on 100 years without letting up. What a colossal project that lay before him. He was, his, he was fit for the task and he wielded his hammer better than Thor. For each blow of Noah's hammer completed the massive task for Almighty God. It was a long winter of discontent that met him as many would have beleaguered him with horrible, profane jests, mockings, and even cruel death threats. And this might be the biggest insight yet. I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that Noah knew this ark would float. Yes, I believe that. Absolutely beyond any shadow of a doubt. And this is why. Why would I say that with such certainty and confidence? Because God hasn't made anything that doesn't work yet. Please hear me on that. God hasn't made anything that doesn't work yet. Years upon years and years upon more years, like a long line of infamous days, a century of faith and trust made Noah more holy, more mature, and more certain not more weak, not more in insufficient, and not more feeble, and produced within him such a courage that became the beating muscle of his very heart. Do you know there are countries who can't even say this? Because in some countries, a hundred years is all it takes for a country to descend into horrible depravity and decay and de degenerate totally. This gray-bearded father in the age of escalating depravity and wickedness went on and on and on. Brethren, a million epiphanies couldn't keep him or hold him from this holy work. He went on with his preaching. He went on with his encouragement to his family. He went on tirelessly. He went on relentlessly. He went on pleading for God's help. He went on with his prayers and he went on with those tears even despite the sneering onlookers. He went always before the great husbandman of heaven with his appeals and great pleas. He went on with his outstanding trust in the living God, and he went on without disbelief. And so his affliction became his glory, the Bible says, and it never uses that word affliction lightly. 
These twig-like mockers met a mighty oak of faith, a mighty oak of righteousness, for Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. They encountered a man who was just and perfect in all his generations. Brethren, fathers, may we live up to his example. In conclusion, faith and awe led Noah to do as the Lord directed and appointed him. This holy impetus thrived and flourished in his heart of hearts. When a holy reverence is grafted upon a faith, it's always, it always brings forth good fruit, Spurgeon said. Noah believed the Lord exactly and exactly he obeyed. He heeded his master's advice and humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5, 6. Brethren, this was no tedious delusion, but the word of God propelling him to this mighty work. Noah didn't spend his money on stupid stuff. He embraced the truth and complied with God completely. The scriptures teach this from his life. Noah did everything and exactly as the Lord had commanded him. He didn't alter or modify the plans at all of the Lord, and he didn't scheme his way into a better alternative. God said, make an ark, and we read these incredible words. He prepared an ark with no delays. He prepared the right wood. He prepared the whole family, and he prepared his own heart before the God of this world. In my time as pastor here, I've come to see this. I have. Men are never right by chance. No, they're not. Obedience does, doesn't come by a whim and a fancy. It's intentional. It's deliberate. It's purposeful. The heart must be sold out for God with a holy passion and a lively intention. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus doesn't say use it just a little bit. All of it. It's a spiritual project that doesn't end this side of eternity, and it doesn't end when you finish an ark either. This truth is amazing as well. To build this ark, it would have required a ton of time, a ton of talent, and endless, endless, endless devotion. It cost him his blood, sweat, and tears, and his entire life savings. Yes, I believe it cost Noah and his wife absolutely everything. He was so confident to abide by God's wishes. He sunk all his capital, all his labor, and all his strength, absolutely everything, went into this grand venture for God. Do you know, Noah would have been considered Noah-phobic in his day. They would have mocked him for sure. In all the scorn, Noah went on believing. He went on and on and on and on. And that's what you and I should do. We should never stop. We should never give up. Oh, today we need grandpas and fathers like ever standing up for the word of God, standing up for a wonderful example, standing for the truth. Oh, friends, I plead with you. Be an epistle of grace for your family, ministering to them in the wonderful way for the Lord. Noah found the strength to persevere and didn't let his standards down or let the world lower his values or morality. Fathers, please I'm, hear me on this. It's the business of our life to believe and keep the truth. And your family needs you. And they need your faith. You may not be called to build an ark, but you are called to be a spiritual example for your family. Please stand with God, live for him, and pray for your family without ceasing. It's so needed today. God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. And we just pray, Lord, that, that some men here would hear this truth today and rise up like a Noah today in their family and uh, pray for them and intercede for them and be an example of holiness to them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And next week will be our next installment with Christ's mission. God bless you.